Hey there, everyone. This is Dave DeBow with another episode of the Property Profits Real Estate Podcast. Today, it's a real treat. I've got Scott Trench on the call with me, and Scott is calling in from beautiful Denver, Colorado. How are you doing today, Scott? I'm doing great. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. My pleasure. So, Scott Trench is a very, very sharp young gentleman. He is a real estate entrepreneur. He's a he's a realtor. He's the CEO of Bigger Pockets, which is a monster in online training for real estate investors. I think it definitely has to be the the biggest source for online education about real estate investing out there, as far as I know. And uh, he's an active real estate investor himself. So uh, Scott, very, very pleased to have you on the call today here. And and when we asked you what what you would suggest as a title for our conversation, you put down here, investing for financial freedom as a side business or a hobby. Now that's very, very interesting. So tell me a little bit about your philosophy when it comes to investing in real estate and, and you know, why you kind of look at it uh, as a good option for people to be doing as a side gig or as kind of a hobby instead of a full-time thing. Sure. So I, I think that a lot of the conversation online and in real like on bigger pockets, for example, and all that kind of stuff tends to be dominated by folks who are very passionate about real estate investing as a business. And I believe that there's a, a silent majority of landlords, a silent vast majority of landlords who own rental property passively as one component of their overall wealth building strategy. So I love and I'm friends with many different investors who are, hey, this is my business, this is full time, I am, or I'm aggressively pursuing real estate with the intention to make it my full time thing. But I think it's also a very viable approach for someone like me who's got a full time job that's not real estate investing and still intends to deliver significant returns in excess of alternatives like stocks or other different asset classes through privately held real estate that I own and control. And I think that there's a, a lot of ways to do that. Um, that are not discussed as much, you know, maybe as, as much uh, by the community. Yeah, I think you're right. I think sometimes you put up the full-time real estate investor on a pedestal as, as that's the goal that everybody should be aspiring to. And that's not necessarily the case. I mean, a lot of people love their jobs and why would you leave that? However, I think you and I are definitely on the same page where we both agree that real estate is probably the best choice for everyday people to create significant wealth cash flow, uh, eventually the lifestyle they're looking for in a way that, you know, most people just can't do otherwise. So I think we're, we're definitely on the same page there. Now you've written a book called Set for Life. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How did that book come around and, and how did you develop this passion for, well, you call yourself a personal finance nerd. So how did, how did you become a personal finance nerd? Yeah. So, you know, the goal, I, well, Going back to the beginning, I started my first job at a, uh, a Fortune 500 company, and uh, it was rated at the time the worst place to work for in America or something like that. <laughs> no, it wasn't all that bad, but I did feel that my opportunity to advance quickly was not there. It just wasn't a reality for me to double my income or you know rapidly rise through the ranks or realize some of the great ambitions that I had uh, at the time. And so I became very interested in the concept of financial freedom generally. And there were two schools of thought that really kind of honed my philosophy on achieving financial independence or financial freedom. Um, one was this Mr. Money Mustache blog, a guy with a funny name who talks about saving as much money as possible uh, through significant lifestyle cutbacks and, and choices and those kinds of things um, and how to be happy while doing that. And the other thing I saw was real estate returns could generate significantly higher returns than other asset classes. So my approach is kind of like, hey, I'm going to pack lunch every day and really be frugal so I can accumulate enough money to make a real estate investment as rapidly as possible after graduating college. And so that's really been a passion of mine over the last few years is how do I help folks that are very ambitious, that are maybe just starting out in their careers and are looking to aggressively move toward financial freedom and put themselves in position to make a real estate investment purchase. Um, and to that end, my, my approach was, hey, I'm gonna save up as much money as possible and then do this, make this first investment called a house hack. Um, I don't know if your, your listeners are familiar with, with that term. No, we aren't, so we'll, we'll jump into that after you, after you finish telling your story, but yeah, I definitely love to get some 
Yeah. yeah. So, well, I, you know, in that first job, I was making $48,000 a year and I saved about $20,000 on that income. Wow. Now wow. that was also with some moonlighting. So I would drive Uber and tutor and stuff after work to, to supplement that. But I used $12,000 of that income of that, of that savings to purchase a duplex in Denver. I was an owner occupant. So I put down 5% um, on this $240,000 duplex. I fixed up the other half. It, it wasn't like a major rehab, but it was a little bit of work, you know, staining cabinets, you know, fixing, you know, replacing the toilet, placing the sinks, putting vanities in, those kinds of things, but not moving walls or right. major plumbing or electrical overhauls or anything like that. Um, I put a tenant in the other side, got a roommate from my side. Both units were two bed, one bath. And that was my first real estate investment purchase. Um, it enabled me to live for free. I think I collected $1,700 a month in rent on a $1,550 mortgage, including principal, interest, taxes, insurance, and mortgage insurance that came along with my 5% down payment. Um, and I think that's a very powerful way for someone that doesn't have any assets and is just starting out in life in their career to get into this game of real estate investing with relatively low risk because yes, I'm le highly leveraged, but I'm also living in the property. I'm living, you know, my risk is limited to the, to, Hey, rents would have to fall dramatically or I have to be really unable to place a tenant for a long period of time before I come out behind where I would be as a renter on a, on a monthly cash flow basis. Most definitely. No, that's, that's very, very smart. So talk to me before we jump into what house hacking is, because I'm, I was not familiar with that term until I was doing a little bit of research prior to our call. But tell us, tell me a little bit about your real estate investing philosophy. What, what are you focusing on? What market are you in? What strategy do you kind of uh, tend to be drawn towards? Okay. So, so here I am, I'm the CEO of biggerpockets.com and I'm about to tell you something that, you know, people might disagree with to a certain extent, but you know, when I model it out and I look at the, and I'm going to start with the stock market. When I look at the stock market and I think about an index fund investment over a very long time horizon, I think you're going to get about an eight to 10% long-term comp and annual growth rate nominally right before, mm -hmm. after inflation. So my, Real estate investment must beat that by a significant amount if I'm going to invest in real estate and put in the hours and hours of upfront education by listening to podcasts, reading books, meeting people, all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, the hours and hours of operation activity and acquiring and operating my portfolio. Right. So I've got to get better than that. And I've got to get significantly better than that. If I look at an unleveraged real estate investment without, you know, without any debt, you know, the long-term appreciation rates of property in the United States are about three and a half percent, right? That's the Case Shiller Long Term Home Price Inflation Index, or I'm probably butchering the name of the of part of that. But Case Shiller is going to you look it up. It's going to show you that the long term appreciation rates on properties that are already built, not new properties, new, right. new home prices are inflating at a higher rate than that. But for the, what's relevant to us as investors is the property price, the purchase of the, the structure you've got, the structure you've purchased. That's about three and a half percent. Now, then you have to do your cash flow estimate, right? And I think if you're being, if you look at a nationwide basis, you know, it's very difficult to get what the average cash flow of a real estate investment is going to be in any data form. So I'm right. guessing at this one, but let's call it a 50, let's say whatever your rent is, 50% of that's going to go to expenses unleveraged uh, on average across the United States. So if you have a thousand dollars a month in rent, you're going to get $500 in expenses, right? Okay. Well, my estimation is that between that cash flow and the long-term appreciation rates, you're going to be looking at a seven or eight percent annual compound compound annual growth rate in unleveraged real estate investment, mm -hmm. which is unacceptable because it's less than the stock market, right? Okay. Yeah. So how do I get more returns? I use leverage, right? So all that saying, I feel like this is an important component of my philosophy about real estate investing. And if I didn't go through this exercise, I wouldn't understand why I'm bothering with this concept of real estate investing. With the use of leverage, I can dramatically drive up my returns in an average year. So if I have a 3.5% inflation in an average year over my real estate hold period, right, and I'm leveraged 5 to 1, I'm going to get a 17.5% return on, on just that appreciation rate, right? Yeah. Plus I'm on the mortgage, plus I'm getting some cash flow. My returns are really great in the first year or two or three of my hold period. And as I deleverage, I return on my return from a return on equity standpoint to that overall 
portfolio return of an unleveraged real estate investor, right? So well, if I paid on the mortgage, I'm getting an all cash real estate return. So my philosophy around this is I'm going to buy consistent properties and I'm going to keep them reasonably leveraged, but make sure that I have strong cash flow and a strong cash cushion to fall back on so that I can sustain meaningfully higher returns than about a 10% return that I think I could get in the stock market over time. So that means in practice, so I, mean, I consistently buy and use moderate leverage on my portfolio. So what would, what would be in your mind, moderate leverage? What, what are you shooting for? What kind of loan to value for lack of a better term, would you be looking at? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's basically buy every 12 to 18 months, yeah. um, putting it down about 20, 20 to 25%. So now in practice, I've house hacked a few times. So I've got a couple of duplexes, which have significantly higher leverage, but also in practice, the Denver market has appreciated much faster than that three and a half percentage thing. So my overall right. portfolio is probably leveraged at a, uh, I probably have 60% debt um, on my portfolio currently, which, you know, is, is probably pretty good. But again, I'm, I'm fairly new to this. So I'm still four or five years into my first real estate cycle right. as an investor. And I hope to be in this game for a very long period of time. So I'm, I'm going to continue to be very relatively conservative, have a strong cash position and buy well within my means as I go along this path. Sounds good. So tell us a little bit about what house hacking is, because it's a fascinating concept. Absolutely. I think this is the most powerful way for perhaps young people or people that are interested in getting started in real estate to get going in this, in this business. So again, the, the massive advantage is it's basically just rent out a house. You, you buy a house or a duplex or a triplex or a quadplex, one of those residential properties that you could still get Fannie Mae 30 year fixed rate mortgages on. Um, and you move in and rent out the other units. And the reason this is so powerful is for a couple, you know, there's a couple of reasons why this is so powerful. One, you can use extraordinary amounts of leverage that are just not accessible to the ordinary investor. That does two things. One, it inflates your returns very dramatically. And two, it allows you to get into the game much sooner than would otherwise be possible. So if you're a median income earner earning 50 to 60, $70,000 a year, and you're trying to buy your first property, it could be 10 years before, you know, or three or four, three, three or four or five years, at least if you're saving five, $10,000 a year, but you could be in a property in two years if you go through the, the house hacking approach. Um, now I just talked about how that three and a half percent return is a 17 and a half percent return if you're using leverage, right? Right, right, right. You know, you talk about putting down 5% on a property and you have an average year with inflation, you're looking at 100% returns, right? Now there's closing costs and all that kind of stuff, but that's a literal, I think, reality in an average market for a house hacker to get, get that leverage. So, so if I'm understanding correctly, you're saying, because again, slightly different terminology, most of our listeners are up here in Canada, mm -hmm. but the idea is if you get into your own primary residence with 5% down, you get a, a residential mortgage on a property. And here in Canada, you can get anything up to a fourplex mm -hmm. with a residential mortgage. Then you live in one of the units, you rent out the others. They, they, the cash flow from that hopefully covers most, if not all, of your, your mortgage expenses. And you're basically living rent-free. Is, is that what I'm understanding? And maybe even cash flowing. That's exactly right, right? That's exact, and that describes my first situation perfectly. And that is a tremendously powerful position for someone who's just starting out in this business to be in because you no longer have a housing expense. Your savings rate can dramatically accelerate uh, if you make that purchase, right? Even if you don't get it so that it pays the entire mortgage, even if it's paying most of the mortgage and that's significantly less than it would cost you to live as a occupant of a single family home. I mean, this is a, a very powerful starter home property purchase that you can do. If you do it once or twice, you may find that those two for first two purchases and those over a three, four year span can generate enough cash flow to pay for a true single family residence that you and your family go on to occupy down the line. Um, and then again, the risk component here is, is, you know, we talk about using lots of leverage. When you put down 5% and you're leveraged 20 to one, that's a lot of leverage, right? Mm -hmm. that's a, people think, oh, that's very risky. But I'd argue that the homeowner is at much more risk than you. If there's, so, so people who are putting down 5% to buy a single family home, I don't know what the minimum down payments are. Yeah, that would be it. Yeah. So if, if that's the minimum down payment, that person's at a lot more risk than a house, than a house hacker. Funny term, I guess. I, I like the word house hacker. Someone, <laughs> I I like the word house hacker a few years ago. So, um, uh, but if you put down that 5% as a homeowner, you're not getting any help from your tenants. 
So mm-hmm. I think that there's, I think that the, the, this is a v- relatively low risk way to have opportunity at huge upside um, compared with the alternatives in living. Now, I wonder, have you, have you uh, talked with anybody or are you familiar with people who already perhaps own their own home and they want to try and figure out how, a way to house hack what they already have? As, yeah. As yeah, I think that the, the short-term rentals are becoming more popular these days. I like think that the Airbnb type thing. Yeah, you know, you have a section of your house you can Airbnb. It's a great way to offset some of that some of the mortgage costs. Uh, it all depends on how far you want to go on this, right? As a 23-year-old, I was going to go pretty far and buy a, a, a duplex in a up-and-coming neighborhood in Denver yeah. uh, and fix it up. Uh, but if you're a little, you know, in a different position, you might want to maybe buy a nice quadplex that doesn't quite cover the cost of your mortgage, but allows you to live in luxury for significantly less cost than it would if you just bought a unit standalone. Yeah, um, definitely. So, and, and the same thing applies at every level. So if you have a house, you can build a carriage house above the garage or in the backyard or whatever and start getting rental income. There's a lot of ways to make this work. Um, and there's a whole spectrum of possibilities. Definitely, definitely. Awesome, Scott. Time flies when, we, when we're doing a 17-minute interview. So uh, as we're wrapping up, why don't you tell us a little bit about Bigger Pockets uh, what, what that's all about, how people can find out more about that. Also, you know, you've written this book set for life. I, I listened to an interview that you were doing about the book. It sounds fascinating. It sounds like you've got three different phases that you take people through. So first of all, tell us a little bit about bigger pockets and then we'll wrap up and you can tell folks how to get a, a copy of your book as well. Sure. So, uh, biggerpockets.com is the world's largest investing resource for real estate investors, folks that are looking to uh, buy real estate that they privately own and control and generate returns. So most of our, our, uh, our users are in the US and Canada um, and are typically buying, I would say that the majority are buying those one to four unit properties, but there's also plenty of information about commercial, small commercial real estate all the way up to hundreds of units in apartment complexes. So whatever you're interested in, you're gonna get access to a variety of perspective from successful investors and be able to ask questions in our forums, listen to our podcasts, watch videos, all that kind of stuff, read our books. We've got information on how to be successful and make better quality decisions um, with the goal of helping you buy a, a, a investment piece of real estate that you believe will advance your financial position in the best way possible. Awesome, sounds good. And people interested in finding out more about your book, Set for Life, what's yeah, your sure. Yeah, so the, the, we have a, a podcast on Bigger Pockets called the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, where you can listen to me uh, preach about personal finance and real estate. Uh, there's a lot of information about Set for Life there. And the book itself, like you mentioned, is a, a three pronged approach for someone who's starting out on the journey to financial independence from a position of little to no net worth and a median income. And if you can't tell, I'm a bit of, I have a personally aggressive approach to, to, gener- to driving towards financial freedom. So there's a specific audience that the book is for. Um, but if you're interested in that, I think I've got a, a pretty uh, high probability way to make some real progress towards you know, putting together a position of liquidity where you can make significant investments that generate significant pass- passive uh, cash flow over time. Awesome. That sounds good. Scott, thank you very much for your time and your wisdom on today's uh, podcast. It's been pretty short, but uh, that means that perhaps we can have you back on again in the future. And we will talk about a different topic at that time. Uh, really appreciate having you on and thank you everybody for tuning in this week. Sounds great. Thank you, Dave. This is a privilege and great to be here. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Well, thanks very much for checking out the Property Profits podcast. If you like what we're doing here, please head on over to iTunes, subscribe, rate us, and leave us a review. We very, very much appreciate it. And if you're looking to create a regular flow of inbound investor inquiries about your real estate deals, then I invite you to attend one of my upcoming live online demonstrations. And you can check that out at Investor Attraction Demo. Dot com. Take care.